during this talk, I want to present a little bit about the Linnean Society and its collections, both physical and digital, um, as well as presenting some of the work that is being carried out at and by the Society in the discipline of uh, plant humanities. So I'll start um, with a, a short introduction about the Linnean Society. Um, it's quite an obscure learned society. Perhaps uh, I, I'm kind of used to people not knowing much about it. Um, we're called the Linnean Society, obviously, because we uh, host the collections of Carl Linnaeus, the 18th century um, uh, father, well, uh, a naturalist who uh, worked mostly on classification of the natural world and whose long lasting legacy is the binomial as uh, nomenclature. Uh, when Linnaeus died in 1778, um, his collection was bought by a young botanist by the name of James Edward Smith, who's, who's there next to uh, Linnaeus. Um, and having bought these collections and having them shipped from uh, Sweden to uh, London, uh, Smith then founded the Linnaean Society in 1788. And he founded the society on the same uh, uh, model as uh, the Royal Society, so that it's a society made up of fellows who come together uh, in meetings to discuss uh, scientific ideas of the day, often presenting uh, uh, papers uh, and accompanied with uh, specimens and illustration. And, and that's how our collections have grown over the years, much like the Royal Society. Um, some of the papers that have been read at the societies have been uh, quite influential. One of them was uh, Darwin and Wallace's paper, for example, on the theory of evolution by natural selection in uh, 1858. Um, but to go back to our core collections, uh, so just to show you what the society looks like, the Linnean collections which were purchased by uh, Smith are housed in a vault in the basement that you can see here on the right. Uh, and then the rest of the collection is housed within the, uh, the, the library and some of the archival room uh, on Piccadilly. Uh, and within the vault here, you can see the, the varied uh, multitude of objects and artifacts and manuscripts and books that make up the Linnean collections. So we have here, for example, all of Linnaeus's books. Uh, his manuscripts in these uh, wine colored boxes here are all of his correspondence. Linnaeus corresponded with, with about 630 odd people during his lifetime, so a huge amount of letters. Uh, the plants are all in their uh, packets, which were put there by Smith. And then in the drawers around the room, we have uh, insects, shells, and fishes, which are pressed on, on paper. So within a, a small, quite a small room, we have a multiplicity of, of collections. And the, the beauty in, is in having them together like that is that they are very interconnected. And I think that's, uh, uh, as some of my staff have said, it's, it's probably uh, one of the few collections where you have such a multiplicity of objects, artifacts, manuscript, correspondence, artwork, printed books, annotated printed books, which really are essential for, to, in order to understand uh, one item in the collection. So the plants will be informed by the letters that accompanied the plants, uh, furthermore by Linnaeus's own manuscripts, by uh, other specimens which were sent with the plants, and ultimately by Linnaeus's printed works, which are in, in this case, as you see here, uh, annotated. So there's an interconnection within the collection, but there's an interconnection also within different collections. So if you take Smith's collection, for example, which is here, uh, Smith, who founded the society, was also a botanist. Uh, and so we have his herbarium. We also have a carpological collection, uh, which is made up of fruits and pieces of um, seeds, anything that really can't be pasted down on paper. Um, he also collected shells and insects, and but he uh, housed these within Linnaeus's own insects and shell collections, which uh, ends up uh, being a, a quite a, a, a collections with multiplicity of provenance. Uh, and he also has his own uh, archives of letters, manuscripts, and uh, the, the books that he printed. 
So of course there are links between Smith who uh, published about Linnaeus throughout his life, who catalogued some of the, his collections. There's links between these two core collections. And then as the society kind of moved into the uh, 19th century and acquired collections of its fellows, then you have uh, the, the mixing of these new acquisitions within uh, the, these two co core collections. And I'm gonna take an example here of uh, a, a surgeon from the East India Company who was based in Bengal, Mysore and Nepal at the turn of the 19th century. So we don't have a portrait for him. His name was Buchanan Hamilton, Francis Buchanan Hamilton, uh, but we have quite an extensive collection uh, of his. Um, Buchanan Hamilton was mostly a botanist, but he also collected, uh, we've got some of his illustration of fishes, for example, which I haven't, it's an omission, I haven't featured them because I was focusing on the plant for this presentation. His herbarium and his illustration of, of plants are particularly uh, uh, extensive. Uh, and while the herbarium sheets have come to join Smith Herbarium, uh, his uh, other collections are kept separately. The, the great interest is that a lot of these herbarium sheets are linked to the illustrations. And we know that Buchanan Hamilton uh, hired uh, mostly Indian artists uh, to work with him uh, and to help him collect these plans in Mysore, Bengal and, uh, and Nepal. And uh, Buchanan Hamilton, uh, when he came on furlough to England, brought all of these manuscripts, all of the notes that described uh, the, the plans that he had collected and depicted, brought all of these to Smith in, in England uh, in the hope that Smith would publish uh, some of these um, new, well, as, as uh, Yota says, that not new, but newly discovered in Europe. Um, and, and Smith only published a few, a handful of these in exotic botany. And a lot of these, are orchids uh, as this one or the next one here. And this is a nice example of how in our collections, uh, we, also, we often have a, a specimen for which we have the accompanying illustration, in this case, uh, probably painted by an Indian artist of the name of Haludar, and I'll say a bit more about that uh, in a second, and then uh, printed uh, and described formally scientifically by Smith in his exotic botany. Um, and I think the, uh, the plant humanities, where we can think about it as an interdisciplinary study of plants from the perspective of the arts, sciences, and, and humanities uh, that help us to explore the extraordinary significance to uh, human culture really are well placed to draw out these, the interconnectedness between various different materials that you find in a place like the Linnean Society or in any other heritage organization. Um, and through uh, these various material uh, that come to, to complement all the information that can be, be on, the, on, the, on the specimen sheet, uh, we can, uh, you know, they can be used and studied for a, a multiplicity of subjects and, and disciplines. And I, I was just gonna highlight three of them, but of course, I think the, the previous speakers have, um, have done this much more eloquently than, uh, than I can. Uh, one of these obviously is uh, science uh, through the science of taxonomy, which traditionally uh, has been the remit of the Linnean Society and its fellows. But I'm pleased to say, and we now have a bit more than 3000 fellows, that our fellowship is uh, growing and expanding. And, uh, and, and my aim in many ways is to attract uh, humanities scholars to kind of really uh, helped me uh, draw out uh, and explore more the, the collections that we have and that have traditionally been more used by scientists. So there's taxonomy, uh, obviously um, a lot of our specimens, both in the Smith herbarium and in the Linnean herbarium have been used um, because they're type specimens. So they are uh, crucial for the study of new species, for the, the science of taxonomy and classification. Uh, they are also crucial uh, for the science of climate change, but this is something that I have been thinking a lot about, and, and Yota, your, your talk was very inspiring in that respect, because this is definitely something that I would like to develop um, 
at the Linnean Society, we, we have projects, uh, which I'm going to talk about, on other kind of uh, 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 spheres of, of research, but climate change doesn't really feature in, in, in these projects at the moment. And I, I really would like to explore the roles of collections in raising awareness of climate change beyond uh, just being a repository for scientific study, which is essential in, in itself, but to attract a much more uh, varied and wider audience to the society. Um, I should say we're, the society being a learned society has, all, I think we're trying to overcome and possibly overcompensate for being seen as, as quite elitist um, traditionally. Um, so this is, this is an ongoing work. Um, the, the second uh, field of study that I think we're quite successful in attracting is, is art and art history and arts and plants. There's a huge interest in, in botanical art. Um, and I regularly have uh, students, for example, from the Royal Drawing School uh, and from various media study uh, schools who come to come back to these collections, which are uh, absolutely stunning. And um, it makes me think of the uh, wonderful exhibition that was set up by the Wallace Collection in London in early 2020, late 2019, early 2020. Uh, which focused on Indian painting from the East India Company. It was called Forgotten Masters. Uh, and it was such a shame because I think it had to close early because of the pandemic. But it was absolutely a stunning exhibition which uh, um, focused on uh, company artists, Indian painters who worked for the East India Company and for people like uh, Buchanan Hamilton. Uh, and in fact, in, in that um, exhibition, were uh, gallingly a few paintings that used to belong to the Linnean Society, but that were, were sold at auction in the 1960s by the society uh, because it was believed that they did not have any scientific value. And of course, our outlook now is completely different. And we bemoan the fact that uh, th these paintings left the society uh, to pay for grills in the library, actually. Um, but one of the artists who focused uh, quite amply in, in that exhibition was called Haludar, and we believe that he is one of the artists who worked for uh, Buchanan Hamilton, and who's probably the artist behind these unnamed uh, uh, and unsigned um, paintings of plants in our collections. I should say these have all been digitized and they're freely available to browse uh, on, our, on our website. Um, a third uh, strand in, in our research at the moment, and po possibly the most predominant one, uh, is uh, decolonization. And I know the next speaker, Vanita, will talk a little bit more about that. What I kind of think of uncovering the hidden histories of underrepresented participants, like Haludar, for example, in the quest for natural history, historical knowledge throughout the 18th and 19th century. and uh, within that group I would place women, indigenous or enslaved people. Um, so some of the work uh, we are about to embark on is mostly looking towards the transatlantic world rather than India, but there's so much potential in our collections because we've got quite a lot of uh, Indian uh, related holdings. Uh, but they're looking at two projects uh, and these are uh, really just starting. Um, so the Linnean Society is a project partner on an AHRC NERC uh, Hidden Histories funded grant, which is called Unearthing the Contribution of Indigenous and Enslaved African Knowledge Systems to the St. Vincent Botanical Garden under Dr. Anderson. And this is heading, headed by Tina Welch, um, Dr. Tina Welch from the University of Winchester. Uh, and it's about transcribing the um, multiple manuscripts uh, that we hold uh, from Alexander Anderson, who was the superintendent of the Botanical Garden in St. Vincent uh, from about, if I remember well, the 1790s to his death in 1811. And these manuscripts come with a corpus of 148 um, illustrations of plants from that garden. And we know that Anderson employed uh, local uh, and indigenous artists in order to draw and depict the plants that he was acquiring for the garden on St. Vincent. And one of these artists, uh, we're very lucky because it's so difficult to know their names, 
is John Tiley. You can see his signature right down here. John Tiley is described by Anderson as, uh, and I quote, a mulatto from Antigua. So he was probably not enslaved, but a black artist, which is extremely rare to find uh, a black artist uh, signing his work. And we had uh, 11 of his signed work within the corpus of these, uh, these illustrated plans from the St. Vincent Botanical Garden. Uh, and then last, last year in June, we were extremely lucky to be able to acquire this painting of the breadfruit tree, uh, which is pictured here. Uh, and it's, it's a really striking um, piece of work because Tylee's drawings, sorry, and I should have put examples, are, are very traditional uh, 18th century depiction of the plant with just a depiction of some of the leaves and possibly some of the flowers and some of the fruit. Uh, but not of the tree in its entirety, the way the breadfruit tree is depicted here. And what lends, what makes the drawing especially striking is the uh, figure of the man here in a very classical pose. Uh, and we think this is probably an enslaved uh, man from um, the botanical garden because we know that uh, Alexander Anderson employed, well, uh, used uh, enslaved labor for, for his garden. So that's one of the projects that is uh, starting, uh, it's just starting in January. Um, and I'm really pleased that uh, I've just had news uh, of a successful collaborative doctoral award, um, which will take place with Birkbeck University with Emily Senior uh, to focus on the black and indigenous collectors in our material uh, and digital archives at the Linnean Society. And this is about um, really making the um, taking full advantage of this interconnectedness in our collections to go from the uh, mostly uh, plant and herbarium specimens um, and try to get at uh, who really collected it. And this is this comes from actually a collections of fishes that we have from a, a Scottish physician called Alexander Garden, who was based in Charleston and who mm. repeatedly mentions in his letters his use of um, uh, of other uh, people who are not named uh, in order to get the fishes that he then sent to Linnaeus and that are now in our collections. So we know that he uh, used uh, black and enslaved fishermen, for example, to, to get these collections. And so the aim of the, of the doctoral award is to try and get at all these black and indigenous collectors, which are not in our metadata as having been the collectors. And, and I feel that, that that missing link is quite important in the same way that uh, Amy and Therese were talking about earlier on. And I think as they emphasize this, this is not something that I can undertake because it's going to require a huge amount of research because it really means diving into the sources and not only at the Linnean Society, but uh, probably um, abroad as well. Um, so I've race through this, uh, but I, I'm reaching my conclusion already. Um, and I have two conclusions which I think have already uh, been made by, by previous speakers. First of all, it's the importance for projects like these of collaborations between uh, people who have different skills. And for projects like these in, in particular, um, I am not a botanist, and I think uh, botanists are, are vital in order to, for us to, to be undertake, uh, to be able to undertake these projects. So botanists, uh, humanities scholars, and heritage professional, I think are, are like the three uh, arms of, of attack in a way. And by heritage professionals, I mean archivists, librarians, and curators who bring their own um, uh, form of knowledge to, to those projects. And then finally, it's about the importance of ensuring access to all, um, especially for a small institution uh, like our, ours uh, with a small library. And we've seen uh, how on-site access was, has became even more restricted during the pandemic. And um, what I struggle with uh, sometimes is, in, is ensuring enough access through digital means, but retaining some of uh, uh, of the access as as making the library the library or the archive or the museum still a vital place to exist in a way uh, and not uh, disappear because of the digitization. So there's a dichotomy here that is sometimes quite hard to navigate. 
Um, but it means uh, ensuring access not only through digitization and through improved uh, metadata, but also through cataloging and in-depth cataloging. And I'm going to uh, finish with uh, my wish list of a, well, a short presentation of uh, our different systems, uh, and then my wish list, what my wish list would be in order to kind of uh, make planned humanity, humanities research possible, more possible at the Linnean Society. So at the Linnean Society, for example, we have um, three different systems in order to search our collections, uh, and they're of a different age depending on uh, the, their age, basically. Our oldest system of cataloging is the library catalog, which you see here. Um, and because it's the oldest by quite some measure, I think it dates from the early 2000s, it also has uh, manuscripts and some photo photographs in there. Uh, the newer archive catalog has uh, mostly manuscripts. So you see again, these kind of two big silos in our collection, I'm trying to get my cursor, here we go. Uh, the Linnean manuscripts and then the, coll uh, the collection of James Edward Smith. Uh, but then we have the manuscript sequence, which is which are all these manuscripts which have come to us through our fellowships over the years. And then what we call the domestic archives, which are about the running of the society, uh, which include, for example, the society papers, which are the papers who were read at uh, meetings of the society and often come accompanied with illustrations. And then the, the, uh, alongside this, and uh, frustratingly uh, enough uh, that these systems don't talk to each other, are the online digitized collections. And this is where you find all the images that have been digitized. And so we have here again, all the um, uh, collections of Linnaeus, those of James Edward Smith, uh, Alfred Wallace's notebooks when he was in the Amazon and the Malay archipelago and Buchanan Hamilton um, uh, artwork as well. I see this slide is quite old because it should also have uh, Bengal drawings which have gone up since uh, I've reused the slide. Um, and my wish list for, for, for this would be to have a single search system, which would make uh, my life when I'm replying to inquiries and any researcher's life much, much easier because you would be able to search for Darwin and have everything come up all at once. Uh, it would come also with improved scientific metadata. A lot of our uh, plants uh, and uh, insects and all the specimens metadata is I would say uh, relatively poor because again, it, it, they're relatively old. And then improve metadata for humanities researchers, things like watermarks um, uh, as seen here on the right, links between items that would show immediately this interconnectedness between items uh, and would link items that are uh, cataloged in the library catalog in the archive catalog and the specimens which you can only find on the online digitized uh, you know if if there is a, and there is there are links between these items that are not apparent if you're new to our collections and uh, from that the links between these collectors which would show their networks much, in a much much better way and hopefully after the collaborative doctoral award also show the missing links within these collectors by which I mean, uh, you know, the, the people on the ground who often did the collecting for the naturalists. Uh, and combine scientific metadata standards and archival library standards so that everything is uh, so, uh, searchable. And finally, I think a system like this would act um, and the data within those systems would really act as a bridge between uh, scientific and humanities research, which is really what uh, planned humanities is all about. And I'll, I'll stop there. So, thank you.